Hello everyone, my name is Vidushi Sandhir. Welcome to the Deeply Simple Podcast. What we do here is write in the name. We break down deep concepts around mental health and wellness into simpler tools that can become a part of our routine and habits. If you want more resources, if you want to give me feedback or suggestions on future topics, or if you want to work with me, visit my website at www.deeplysimple.info and drop me a line. And I'm very glad that you're here. Let's get started. Today, I want to talk about ways in which we can become more self-aware. The most important project that we will undertake in our lives is getting to know who we really are. If we strip down all titles in personal and professional life, who are you? What drives you? What ideas or beliefs do you carry that are actually not your own and were maybe learned from the childhood or are mandated by society? We often talk about self-care in the wellness industry. But how do you truly take care of yourself if you do not fully understand the self? I'm reminded of a quote by Ayn Rand. To say I love you, one must know first how to say the I. Many therapists suggest that self-awareness is the key to better mental health. And it's not surprising if you dig into the definition of self-awareness, which is basically being in touch with how we are feeling inside in our body. The focus is inside, internal versus external. What triggers challenging emotions in us? How do we feel those emotions? How do we make our way towards more balanced and peaceful emotions? Imagine if you were equipped with this information, how much more control you could exert on your mental health. So let's discuss four practices that can help help us start this inquiry. Who am I? First, how do you waste time? I know it sounds weird, but stick with me. Imagine if you did not have any deadlines at work, there was no external mandate to be productive or to have a to-do list. What would you spend your time on? What articles would you read? What topics would you research? What kind of activities would you engage in? I'm not talking about mindless internet scrolling or news marathons. They're usually an outcome of burnout. I am referring to things where you are completely checked in. You get so engrossed in that that you lose track of time. Activities or topics that send you in a state of flow. And I understand, not all of us have the flexibility to take a sabbatical from work or take a pause from work or to just put a pause on all our familial responsibilities. In that scenario, I would just advise you to look back on a time when maybe you did have some free time. And what were the things that really gripped your attention? You could also go through your internet history and see what are some of the things that you constantly focus on when you're researching for things, not out of necessity, but because you're intrigued and curious and you want to learn about something. I'll give you an example. My partner was a finance guy and an economics major from an Ivy League college. But he decided to quote-unquote waste his time And in that process, he discovered his flow. He realized that he could code for eight hours a day. He took this information and he turned this into a career transformation. He changed his career from a happy vice president at Wall Street to a very, very happy software developer. And he would have never made this transition had he not let himself, again, quote unquote, waste some time. Number two, therapy or coaching. A therapist or life coach offers a non-judgmental and compassionate space to really examine ourselves. Why do we feel the way we do? Why do we make the decisions the way we do? What are we scared of? What are some patterns in our life that no longer serve us? 
With the help of a therapist or life coach, you can start exploring constructive tools that are custom for you and can help you lead a life that is in alignment with you. I personally think this is especially useful as a first step towards self-awareness because a therapist or a coach could be your partner in the self-awareness journey. You don't have to do it alone. For example, it was in these coaching and therapy sessions that I recognized my passion for wellness and went on to study Reiki, Ayurveda, meditation. Number 3. Journaling Ernest Hemingway said, Write hard and clear about what hurts. Sounds morose, I know, but it has a lot of meat. Research done at UCLA shows that journaling can improve cognitive function and can also help manage anxiety. I personally really like free-form journaling, which I actually, this is a tool I learned from my therapist. You put a timer and you write in, with abandon in a state of uninhibition as if no one is reading. So I can basically write whatever the frig I want and I write those things in the moment because maybe that's what I need to process in the moment. Those things are coming up. It's like having a conversation with myself without any filter and that's very, very powerful. It can often bring to awareness experiences, memories and desires that might just be hidden by the daily busyness. And that, my friends, is very useful data. It's input into how you potentially might want to shape the next few days, months, and years of your life. Finally, the fourth tool, which should be no surprise, is meditation. If I want to become more self-aware, it's just, it's just logical that I would, I, I would have to be able to listen to the self. Finally, the fourth tool, which shouldn't be a surprise, meditation. If I want to become more self-aware, I have to be able to listen to the self. We live in a very loud, noisy and busy world. And the only way we can listen to the self is by incorporating some intentional silence. Meditation offers us that. But I want to set expectations. Meditation is not magic and you will not walk away with a calm mind after every session. Rather, in the beginning, you actually might find it really difficult because you're suddenly trying to tame that monkey mind and it does not like that. Or you might have so many repressed thoughts and ideas that would want to come to the fore. But I do want to say that if you stick with it, it's one of the primary ways that allows us to listen to our own voice. But I know the idea of meditating can seem daunting and sometimes even boring. So I want to share some resources that are helpful. You can look up Tara Brock's meditations online. They are of varied length and they are really useful if you're beginning some kind of a meditation practice. You can also check out this app that my partner shared with me. It's called Waking Up by Sam Harris and it has a very nice introductory course. It gives you something to look forward to every day. And finally, you can get the help of a meditation coach. I am a trained meditation and mindfulness teacher. So if you need any support starting your practice, shoot me a message by contacting me through my website, www.deeplysimple.info. Now, before I wrap up, I really want to say that that everyone's season in life looks different. You might have responsibilities right now that take up a lot of your time. You might have shortage of resources because of some life circumstances. But this quest of self-awareness is not meant to be another to-do on your list. It's just a gentle nudge you can start really small. Can you take out an hour a week or every other week for therapy if you have the resources? Can you sit silently on your commute back from work or to work for five minutes without any gadgets, without any media, without any work? Can you take out five minutes on, let's say, a Sunday evening before going to bed to journal? Simple, small steps done consistently. I hope you found this content useful. Everything that I put out there are tools that I have learned on my meditation, wellness and healing journey. I have more podcast episodes that break down other wellness concepts. You can check those out at deeplysimple.info. 
Thank you and I will see you in the next episode.